Welcome. Please stand if you're able and let's worship the Lord together this morning. Can you hear me now? Good morning, church. It is so good to be gathered together. Uh, just a few announcements. First of all, I don't know if you've seen these handy-dandy little cards in the library. Um, this is a pretty cool way to see what opportunities there are here at church to serve. Um, so if you go into the library, you take out your cell phone, and you scan this QR code, it'll take you to a website That'll tell you all about our different openings. And Pastor Aria talked a little bit about this at our congregational meeting. And you can go there and, and figure out where you can help. And if you're not real comfortable using a QR code, you can always grab somebody and ask for help. But also you could just fill this out. And you won't be able to see all the opportunities, but you could fill this out and then put it in the drop box outside of the main office there. Uh, so make sure you check those out if you're looking for a way that you can serve here. Also, 
we have a new month, the month of February. Can you believe it? Uh, if you've gotten a little behind on your New Year's uh, resolutions, just treat January like the trial period. You can get to work starting now. Um, but it is a new month, and we have a new uh, heritage hymn of the month, and it's There Is a Fountain, which is one of my favorites. And I wanted to share with you a testimony from a family here that has been incorporating the heritage hymn of the month into their family worship. They said, family worship is a great way for us to connect and prioritize reading the Bible together. It offers the kids a chance to slow down, think, and ask questions. It's often hard to get 100% focus with young kids, but we trust in consistency, prioritization, and the Holy Spirit's work in their hearts. It's also been sweet for the kids to see us do something we don't usually do and can be awkward, singing together. Another bonus is when we have guests over for dinner, we naturally have opportunities to worship with them or to share the gospel with an unbelieving friend or family uh, or family member. So if the Heritage Hymn has been a blessing to you or any part of our family worship guide that's available out there, if it's been a blessing to you in any way, uh, feel free to share that with another family here and just let them know what, what a blessing it is uh, to be able to sing with your family and to worship together as a family. And I had someone ask me the last time we did this, they said, um, you know, I, I don't have kids in the home, but I'd love to have access to the Heritage Hymn of the month and, and know what they are so that, you know, um, me and my spouse can use them or I could use it alone in my own private devotions. If that's you, feel free to grab a family worship guide and you can just kind of disregard the, the first part of it and go straight to the, the hymn portion of it. We do have uh, plenty. So if you want to just grab one, uh, feel free to do that. I'd like to turn our attention now to our reading together, which is Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. And uh, if we could just all say this together as a church family. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your blood poured out for us on the cross. That all who place their faith in you may be washed clean from every stain of sin. We thank you for that sweet gift of salvation. Though our sins are vile and wretched, you have paid for each and every one of them in full on the cross. We thank you that our salvation will never expire that you will bring to completion the work that you have begun in us, your people. And one day, we'll be in heaven, free from pain and free at last from our sin. And we look forward to a day when we will sing your praises in your very presence, face to face. I pray that as we worship together this morning, as we submit to the teaching of your word and as we partake together of your table, we will do so in authentic devotion to you. And that as we leave this gathering, that you would help us to be committed fully to you, not being conformed to this world, but renewing our minds through your sacred word. I pray that we would give ourselves completely to you as we live our lives in service to you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Please stand if you're able. Let's continue singing together. We'll begin with our heritage hymn for this month, There is a Fountain.
last Sunday of this sermon series, so we'll take time to greet one another. Please stand and say hello to people, and uh, while you stand, children may be dismissed for junior church. Thank you.
All right. I'm going to start with a question. Are you ready for the question? How's everyone doing? All right, good. That's a good start. Let me ask that question again, but let me set it up. Imagine you're talking to a cashier at the grocery store this week. So grocery stores, before you ordered your food online, people used to go and buy supplies from a store, right? And the cashier, let's say the cashier asks you, how are you doing today? What are you going to say? What are you going to say? All right. I'm going to give you one more try. We're in our fifth and final sermon series, sermon on evangelism, on sharing the good news with the world around us. So imagine you're talking to a friend or a family member or a relative or a neighbor, and you know they're not a Christian. They don't have the hope of Jesus in their hearts. You've got it. You know they don't have it. You love them. You're in their world. You're in their life. You're talking to them. And they say to you this week, how are you doing? What could you say to answer that question? What could you say? Well, you could say, I'm hopeful. You could say, I'm blessed. You could say something that lets them know you've got hope. So I tried it this week. In preparation for this message, I tried maybe 90% of the time. When people ask me this week, how are you doing? I said, I'm hopeful. And everybody gave me a strange look. Hopeful? It's 2024. What are you, crazy? How are you hopeful in a world like this? But when we answer the question that way, we have already started the process of sharing the good news. Because the world needs the hope of Christ, and he's given to us the hope of Christ by grace, through faith, purchased for us on the cross. We have it, and the world needs it. And so if you answer a question like that, that way, you've already started evangelism. We'll learn about hopeful evangelism in our words in 1 Peter chapter 3. If you have the Word of God, if you have a Bible with you, please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible with you, it's also reprinted on the back of your bulletin. And if you don't own a Bible, go out into our foyer after the service, grab one of those blue giveaway Bibles. We would love for you to have God's Word in your hand if you want a copy. And if you want to give a copy to a friend, grab one for a friend. Well, today we'll be looking at 1 Peter 3, verses 13 through 17. And I'm going to pray first and then I'll read it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for hope. Thank you for Christ in a world of chaos. Thank you for clarity in a world of confusion. Thank you for giving our hearts and souls hope in a world that desperately needs it. So Father, today, help us be hopeful as we hear from you through your word. Thank you that your word is hopeful Thank you that your word spells out the problem of sin in this world and in our hearts, and yet you don't leave us without a Savior. So thanks for the hope of Christ. Help us be hopeful as we receive your words from you right now. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive your hope this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name, and amen. 1 Peter 3, verses 13 through 17. This is the hope-filled word of God. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. 
Our message is called, Always Be Prepared. Always be prepared. And this text is packed with wisdom for evangelism, for sharing our faith. Last week, we talked about how Jesus ate with sinners and how Jesus sends us out with the ministry of reconciliation to go into this world and to say, be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors. So if we're going to be ambassadors, what do we need to do that well? Because let's be honest, when I went into the barber this week and when I went into the grocery store this week, I wanted a haircut and I wanted food. I didn't really want to be an ambassador all the time. Sometimes I did, but sometimes I don't always want to do that. Sometimes we think we're glad we're saved, but we didn't really sign up to go out into the world as ambassadors. And then sometimes we go out into the world as ambassadors for Christ, but we don't feel prepared. Or we feel ashamed because we're not good enough to share the good news of Jesus. Whatever it might be, Peter is clear in 1 Peter. And so today we have three points. If we're going to be ambassadors, if we're going to do evangelism, we are blessed, hopeful, and prepared. Let's be blessed, hopeful, and prepared. So we're going to look at those three points this morning from our text. Number one, as ambassadors of Christ, we're blessed. And before I get to 1 Peter 3, think about all of Scripture we're told over and over and over again, if we have trusted in the Lord Jesus, we're saved, we're forgiven, we're redeemed, we've got hope, and we're blessed. Now, it doesn't mean big, goofy smile, enjoying every minute of it all the time. That's not what blessed means, but it means we're content and happy and hopeful in our hearts no matter what comes. Think about Scripture. Psalm 1, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on that law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. We're blessed. That's how the Psalms start. Psalm 1 starts that way. Psalm 84, 4, blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. So friends, we're blessed because we have a God to sing praise to. Psalm 94, 12, blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Lord. We're blessed because there's a God who cares about us enough to correct us when we're wrong. You want that if you want to grow as a person. We're blessed. Psalm 146, verse 5. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. We're blessed because we have a helper, and we're blessed because we have hope. And not only that, we're blessed if we suffer. Look at verse 13 and 14. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake... You will be blessed. So have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Stop there. It is a blessing to suffer for Jesus. It's a blessing to be counted worthy by our king, to be his ambassador, and to suffer for him. It's a blessing. It's joyful. It's hopeful. It's a blessing. It's not fun or easy to suffer. If you like suffering, that's a problem. But if you understand you're blessed when you suffer for the cause of Christ, it's a blessing. And that's really, really good. Because we're going into the world with good news, and this world right now does not want our good news. So we've got to remember that we're blessed because going into this world with good news is not going to bring us lots of blessings. It might bring us a lot of suffering. I mean, think about it. If you really want this world to like you right now, you're going to have to keep your mouth shut about Jesus. If your highest priority in 2024 is, I want everyone to love me, I want to be liked by everyone, then to accomplish that goal, you're going to have to keep your mouth shut about Jesus. You are. All over the world, Christians are losing their lives for Jesus Christ. All over the world, Christians are losing their families. When they convert to Christianity, their family rejects them. And persecutes them. In many places, your career is threatened if you have and share Christian values. And actually, if you want to suffer, it's going to be really easy this year. Just bring up politics. It's an election year. Oh, no. If you really want to suffer, 
bring up politics. Seriously, if you love your reputation more than the glory of Jesus Christ, you're going to have to remain silent because the world does not want our good news and literally the world does not want our good news. Uh, Back in college, one of my summers home, I uh, served with a ministry called Child Evangelism Fellowship. And Child Evangelism Fellowship puts on good news clubs for kids in the summer and also in schools and after school programs. So they're called good news clubs. And a lot of clubs are allowed in public schools in our country. Uh, But in Hawaii, it was in the news this week that they don't want the good news clubs in the schools at all for school, after school, on the side, whatever it might be. And uh, this is actually a quote from the article I read from World Magazine. Lincoln Elementary Principal Jacqueline Ornelas told Child Evangelism Fellowship over the phone that her, quote, school administration did not like the idea of a good news club meeting at the school. So they said, we don't want good news club anywhere near our children. They literally don't want our good news in Hawaii, so that'll go through litigation and all that. Because there's bad news clubs that are allowed in school, and weird news clubs that are allowed in school, and chess news clubs that are allowed in school, but not good news clubs. Not there. So the world doesn't want it. And so we're going to go out into this world, and we're going to suffer. But when we suffer for Jesus, verse 14, even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Not by the world, but by God. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. So friends, we're ambassadors of Christ in this world with the good news, with hope. And number one, we're blessed. Peter says we're blessed, especially when we suffer. Well, second, we're not just blessed, we're also hopeful. And the hope of Christ in us is the thing that people are going to notice. Hopeful. Uh, This is always a good answer to how are you doing because it shocks people. Hope is hard to find. I said it maybe 20, 30 times this week and almost everyone said hopeful. What do you mean hopeful? My barber was like, hopeful? Are you sure you're of sound mind to get a haircut right now? That's what he was probably thinking. In evangelism, if we're going to go out in Jesus' name, we should try to find ways to show the world that we're hopeful. And when someone says, how are you doing? You can say, I'm hopeful, and you've already shown them you're hopeful. And the world is stuck in darkness, and that means, you know what? We're also going to fail most of the time at this. You know, we've been talking about evangelism for five weeks. I was reading from that red book by J. Max Stiles, and I've got it over there. If someone wants to peek at it, I gave a few copies away. This guy does evangelism, and he's done it hundreds and hundreds of times. And he says in an interview I watched with Max Stiles, he says, you know what? In evangelistic efforts, we fail 99% of the time, but we celebrate every effort. So in evangelism... Taking light into a world of darkness, we're going to fail 99% of the time, and that's okay. We're going to celebrate those efforts to share the good news of Jesus, and yet we're going to fail most of the time. We're not going to see someone come to Jesus Christ every day. That's not how we should expect it to go, which is why we need to be, point to hopeful. Not only that, we're hopeful because Jesus is building his church. And that means when you go out into the world with the gospel, the results are not up to you. Amen? Okay, if the results were up to you, boy, would we be in trouble. And this for me in evangelism in college was the absolute game-changing understanding. As I worshiped God and trusted him and obeyed him in obedience, I had to come to this realization because I was miserable sharing my faith in college until I realized this. That God is the only one who can change a heart. So my freshman year in college, my roommate, for a number of reasons, almost killed me. Okay? Now, I'm not going to explain. You can ask me afterwards why. Uh, but we, we weren't best friends. So I needed a good friend on the hallway, and I found a guy named Dave. My name's Dave, and I found a guy named Dave. If your name's Dave, we get along together. If your name's Dave today, I hope you're having a great day. So this guy, Dave, he and I would talk about faith 
regularly, and I thought it was my job from the Lord to convert Dave by the end of this semester, or I was a failure. So every time we got into a conversation and faith came up, I struggled. Do I have the right answer? Do I have the right philosophical argument? Can I explain the anthropic principle to him to explain that you can't have a world so suitable for humankind? Obviously, God had to make this. I thought I had to have all the answers. I thought I had to convert him every time I talked. And every time I didn't convert him to Jesus Christ, I felt like a failure. You know why? Because I idolized myself in evangelism. I forgot that I can't change a heart. And once I came to realize, by the help of some older Christians, I can't change a heart, I can't change a life, then I remembered my job is just to be an ambassador, just to deliver the good news. It's not my job for how they feel when they open the mail. I'm supposed to deliver the mail. Hopeful evangelism comes when you realize Jesus is building his church, not you. We're just ambassadors. I have another book that I'm going to give away. I have four copies up here. And if you want one of them, come up to me afterwards and let me know you're taking it so I can see who takes them. And then if you finish reading it, it's a booklet. It'll probably take you a couple hours to read. Uh, let me know how it goes afterwards. But it's called, What If I'm Discouraged in My Evangelism? Boy, do we all need that, don't we? And here's a quote related to the story I just shared. Uh, this is Isaac Adams. He says, I once shared the gospel with a friend who rejected it. As we parted ways, I felt like a failure and like I dishonored God. I see now, however, that my discouragement emerged from a misunderstanding. I was approaching evangelism like a salesman. I acted as if I had to sell the gospel to my friend. And since I didn't close the sale, I figured my boss, God, would be mad at me. And so I was mad at myself. But friends, being rejected for sharing the gospel is normal. Didn't Jesus tell us as much? If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. So he says in the book, instead of making us despair, rejection should make us rejoice. It's a blessing to suffer for Christ. And we've got hope. The hope in evangelism comes from knowing what and who saves. Here's what and who saves. The gospel of Jesus Christ saves. And that gospel is written in God's word. And I have the little black gospel booklets if you want a reminder of how to explain the gospel. A couple hundred more here. We've had them out all series. You can take a pile. You can take one or two. Study it so you know the gospel. The gospel saves and God saves. You know what doesn't save? You having all the right answers to hard questions. You having all the right explanations to people's problems with the Bible. Your tactics don't save. Your efforts don't save. Our God saves by the gospel of Jesus. So here's our job. This is my definition for hopeful evangelism. Ready? Show and share the hope of Jesus and explain the gospel as the opportunity comes up. I'll say it again. Hopeful evangelism. Show and share the hope of Jesus and explain the gospel as the opportunity arises. That's success. That's hopeful. It's not a failure to not be able to do what you can't do and what only God can do. So friends, in evangelism, we can be hopeful. As ambassadors, we're blessed, we're hopeful, and finally, prepared. We should want to be prepared for this task. Well, look at verse 15. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared. Prepared for what? Well, what does it say? Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So stop there. If you're in Christ, saved by Jesus, redeemed, then you have hope. You have something the world needs and the thing you can't buy on Amazon. Hope. We have it. And if you have hope, hope in your life and people see it, they might ask, where did you get it? Why are you hopeful? And it literally happened to me this week when I answered the question, how are you doing? I said, hopeful. And someone was like, why are you hopeful? All I had to do was say I was hopeful in a world like this. And people were like, why are you hopeful? Well, there it is. You have hope, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. So how can we prepare as ambassadors of Christ to go into this world and show them hope 
and be ready to give an answer when they ask us for the reason for the hope that we have. How can we be prepared? This is the final message in our evangelism series. We're going to end with two types of preparation. So point three is prepared. Two subpoints: spiritual preparation and tactical preparation. We're going to get really, really practical as we end in just a few minutes. First, spiritual preparation. And that's our text. Look at verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. If you're going to share the good news and face potential suffering and persecution for it, your heart must love Christ first. And you must love the Lord Jesus Christ more than the person you're sharing him with. You must love Christ. Christ the most. He's holy. He loves you the most. He came out of heaven and took on human flesh and walked among us to bring the good news to us. And so he loves us the most and he came for us. And so if we love him the most, we will go out for him. And remember that his opinion of you matters the most. The opinion of Jesus about you matters more than what your friend thinks of you and more than what you think of you. His opinion matters most. So honor Christ in your heart. That's the first way to spiritually prepare. Now look at verse 15. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. That's it. Do you have hope in you? And does it show? Do you have hope in you? And does it show? Sometimes I find it hard to walk around hopeful. I know I have hope. I know I've got the gospel. But I'm always thinking about my pain and my trials and my suffering. And when people say, how are you doing? I'm usually tempted to whine and complain. So people say, hey, how are you doing? And I'm like, well, two of my kids are sick. My back hurts. We had water damage in our basement. I'm busy. That's what I feel like saying. So we've got to prepare our hearts and minds to be hopeful since we are. The hope is there, but you've got to work on it. So I said it this week. I said, I'm hopeful all week. And I was surprised and amazed at how many people wanted to know why I said hopeful. So you've got to prepare. Prepare your heart with the hope of Christ. Now verse 15 continues, yet do it with gentleness and respect. When we go out into this world and we share the hope of Jesus, why do we need to go with gentleness and respect? Because Jesus was gentle and lowly And he ate with sinners and tax collectors. And he said, follow me. Be like me. When we bring the good news to this world, we need to have gentleness and respect. Everyone we're evangelizing is made in the image of God and worthy of full dignity to be treated like a person. Like someone who deserves to be loved. Plus, we're ambassadors. Think about an ambassador of a country who didn't come with gentleness and respect. Let's say the Canadian ambassador was speaking in the United States, and everywhere he went, he was really loud and angry, eh? We wouldn't listen to him anymore. Who wants to listen to an angry, loud, screaming, yelling, threatening ambassador? Do this with gentleness and respect. So going into evangelism, prepare to be gentle and respectful like Jesus. Now verse 16. Having a good conscience. Let's stop there. The joke about a clean conscience is that if you have a clean conscience, it means you have a bad memory. Because you forgot how the last week went. But in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation, even if you've sinned. And in evangelism, we can have a good conscience because all we're doing is being ambassadors for Jesus, representing him. We're not even in charge of the results. If things go poorly, you can have a good conscience because you're an ambassador of Christ. Even if verse 16 happens. Look at verse 16 now. So that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it's better to suffer for doing good, that should be God's will, than for doing evil. And here's a hard truth we need to come to terms with. If we're going to be Christians representing Jesus in 2024 in this world, in this culture, the Bible does not say some followers of Jesus might be slandered in rare circumstances, in certain environments and situations on occasion. That's not what it says. That's not what Peter says. If you're a disciple of Jesus, Peter says, when you are slandered for it. When 
you are slandered for it. We should expect and prepare to be mocked and laughed at and slandered from time to time if we're going to share the good news of Jesus. Remember, if you want to be popular and loved by the world, you're going to need to keep your mouth shut about Jesus. So prepare to be made fun of. Every kid was made fun of in high school. And if you weren't, you were made fun of behind your back. Everyone was. Right? It's okay to be made fun of. As long as you're being made fun of for the right things. Honoring Christ Jesus as Lord. And going into this world, serving the King as his ambassador. And how do you prepare to be slandered? Remember what Peter says, it's a blessing. So that is our spiritual Preparation. Look over this passage this week and remember, gentleness, respect, prepared with hope to be slandered. And if you suffer, it's a blessing. Well, we're blessed, we're hopeful, and we're prepared. Now we've got to be spiritually prepared. And second and finally, as we wrap our series up, tactical preparation. Let's get really, really practical about ways to get conversations to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to start from scratch And I'm going to assume that some of you, many of you are Christians. And if you've never done evangelism before, if you've never had a conversation that got to the gospel, let's just start there and get really, really tactical. So six tactics. Number one, greetings. Number one, greetings. How are you doing today? The answer is hopeful. Let's try it. How are you doing today? Hopeful. You did it. The conversation has now shifted to a potential opportunity for evangelism because we go out into this world with hope that the world needs and be prepared just in case someone asks you for it. If you say you're hopeful, someone might ask you for a reason for the hope that you have. And guess what? The best part of this tactic is you don't even have to start it because people are going to start it for you and ask you how you're doing It's as simple as that. Maybe you'll say hopeful to the same person 40 straight times. And after the 40th time, they'll say, you're crazy. Why are you hopeful? Tell me why you're hopeful. And there it is, the open door. The door's wide open. So, greetings. People start that one for you. Second, politics. Now, here's why I said, you said hopeful. Pastor, you said it's going to be hopeful. 2024 is an election year. People are going to bring up politics. And yes, Jesus must be central to how we think about using our vote for the good of others. And yes, of course, God's law must inform our nation's laws and how we use our power as a nation to treat other people. So we will not compromise as Christians when we vote to honor Jesus Christ as Lord. And yet we have a much more hopeful answer when there's a conversation at work or at school about politics that everyone is annoyed with. You can say, I I know what you're talking about, but my hope is not in this government. You say that, not only will you get out of a political conversation you're annoyed with, if you are, tactics, you'll shift the conversation to the hope that you have, which is even if this country is a disaster, you have a greater hope. And someone might say, you have hope in 2024 for something greater than the government? Why don't you tell me about that? People are going to talk about it. There's your way out of those conversations and into Jesus. Third, church events. All right, here's one way I failed at evangelism this week. I got my hair cut Wednesday, and my barber asked how I was doing, and I said, I'm hopeful, and we had that conversation. But as we were talking, I mentioned our men's breakfast. By the way, men, that was awesome yesterday. 71 guys. We ran out of bacon because it was, I had the scraps. But I, at, the, at the barber, I'm talking to him, and, and I said, you know, we've got this men's breakfast. We're talking about what it means to be a man. And he and I were talking for a while, and I never got around to inviting him. So there I dropped the ball. I felt a little bad about that afterwards. I did say I was hopeful, and we talked about that. But I thought, oh, I could have invited him. I could have invited him. I should. Next time, I'll invite him to a church event that's open for people, right, and welcoming for, for our guests and neighbors. And so I know a couple in this church And what I mean by church events is you can just invite people to our church. You can invite people to our church events. That's how you can do evangelism. Invite them. Because how we love each other as a church is evangelism. It is a testimony. They will know you are my disciples by how you love one another. So there's a couple in this church, and they're not here today. 
And uh, they both were invited by someone who doesn't even go to our church anymore to an event. I think it was a Saturday night event. We had an all-church event where there, we had games and food and fun stuff like that. This was like 10 years ago. And that couple thought we were crazy, right? That couple, the guy told me, he's like, you guys, I don't know. But they saw that we loved each other. And they saw that we weren't as crazy as he thought we were going to be. And they started coming on Sundays. And they learned about Jesus. And that couple has come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because they were invited to a church event and saw how we are a loving group of people, a family. And they wanted to be a part of that. And so they came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I got to baptize them. And they became members. And now they serve at this church. And you want to know where they serve at this church? They serve at church events that we invite our neighbors to. Because that's how they came to know the love of Jesus. They saw the hope we had. And all someone did was say, I'm going to an event on Saturday at my church. And you're invited. Come with me. And now they've got eternal life. And they have hope. So church events. Tactics. Fourth, Mondays. Are Mondays your favorite day of the week? Who's, whose favorite day of the week is Monday? Okay, all right, all right. A couple of hands, a couple of hands. What does everyone do on Monday? They talk about their weekend. What did you do on the weekend? You got together with your church family. You worshiped your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You're his ambassador. And I trust and pray that you go home from our Lord's Day gathering with hope in your heart, the hope of Jesus Christ. Everyone else is saying what they did over the weekend. You could say, I had a rough week last week, but I went to church and I got my hope back. You could say, I went and got together with my church family on Sunday. Everyone else is saying what they did on Sunday. You could. Think about Jesus, right? He approaches the woman at the well and they talk about water. And Jesus is like, I have better water than that. And she's like, I want that water. So you can say, this weekend... After a rough week, I got my hope back when I worshiped with my church family. That's a way to bring the topic up. Fifth, we're almost done, death. Death. We talked about death has lost its grip on me. We are the people who don't have to be afraid of death. So let's say you live at a retirement home. Someone's dying every week. Or a a facility where they take care of you, nursing home, things like that. Someone's dying every week. That's all people are talking about. If it becomes known that you are one of the only people not afraid to die, people are going to ask you for a reason for the hope that you have. Whenever topic of death comes up, we can share a hope that the world cannot get anywhere else. So they might want to know, why aren't you afraid to die? And what we can say is, death isn't the end of my life. Because I've got eternal life through Jesus. Six and finally, listening. People love to talk. As you listen to your loved ones, your friends, your neighbors, your classmates, listen to where they're putting their hope and think about how you can talk about that thing and get them to tell you why they hope in that. And that gets the discussion to what they hope in and maybe you'll get to talk about what you hope in. This world loves to talk. People love to talk about themselves. You're you're almost not going to believe this, but it actually happened. And it happened this week. I was at the hardware store getting light bulbs. You want to know how people like to talk about themselves? Ready for this? I got one pack of light bulbs at the hardware store because I couldn't find the other thing I needed. I got light bulbs, and there's a guy, he's a cashier, and he said, oh, light bulbs. I hate buying light bulbs. I was like, oh, why do you hate buying light bulbs? (laughs) Where's your hope? So I'm paying for these light bulbs, and while he's, we're doing the credit card thing, He goes, you know what else I hate buying? Socks and underwear. (laughs) I bought light bulbs. And we got real personal. (laughs) God designed every human being to want to talk about themselves. Because we're all created with a mission and a purpose and hope. People will talk. You'll be surprised. So just listen. Listen. Find out what people hope in and ask them, why do you hope in that? And maybe the conversation, there will be an open door for you to share a reason and defend the reason for the hope that you have. Those are some tactics. I hope those are helpful. I hope those are helpful. Simple, tactical ways to get the conversation to the hope that we have. The world needs it. Christ bought it for us. But more than anything else, we must remember that we cannot save people. 
The gospel is the good news, and Jesus is the one who saves. So we pray as a church for our loved ones who don't know Jesus, and we fix our eyes on Jesus. We remember it's a blessing to suffer for him. And as we close, brothers and sisters, remember the gospel truth. We don't have to prepare ourselves. Jesus is preparing us. In fact, you know what comes right after our passage about being prepared? If you have your Bible open, look at the verse right after the be prepared passage. 1 Peter 3, 18, the reminder, for Christ also suffered, because we're called to suffer, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is a privilege and a blessing to suffer as we hopefully evangelize, as ambassadors for Jesus who suffered and died to bring us to God. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. We have the hope of Jesus and the world needs it. So I'm going to end with a question. How are you doing? Hopeful. Hopeful because of Christ. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your hope. Thank you for pouring your hope out to this world at the great cost of your son's life. Thank you that he took on our flesh. He became one of us and walked among us. And he suffered and he willingly suffered for us so that he could bring us to you, so that he could reconcile us to God. That's such a hopeful message. So Lord, send us out as hope-filled ambassadors, prepared with gentleness and respect and the hope of Christ, prepared to suffer and prepared to show and share the hope that we have. Lord, help us show that hope to the world. And Father, I ask that everyone in this room, everyone who can hear my voice right now, that you would give us all a chance this week, at least one, to share the hope of Christ with someone who needs it. Help us love them like you love them. For our good and their good, and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the hope of Christ comes from staring at the gospel. And on the first Sunday of the month, we share the Lord's Supper together. In a moment, we're going to pass the bread and the cup. Jesus offered his life as a ransom for many. And one day he's going to return. And until Jesus returns, we celebrate his death and his resurrection by participating and partaking of communion, according to the model Jesus gave if you're here this morning and you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you've repented of your sins and trusted in him for salvation, you're invited to join us in this meal. And if you're not sure about that, or if you just need to have a heart-to-heart -heart with God and be real honest with him because there's some unconfessed sins in your heart right now, it's okay to pass that plate. No one's going to judge you. We're going to be fixing our eyes on Jesus. So it's okay. There is no shame to pass the bread in the cup. But if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and if you're worshiping him today, please join us. And until he returns, he's the one preparing us. He's the one building his church. Listen to how the gospel, how Paul talks about what Jesus is doing for us right now, preparing us for his mission. Paul explains it in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might, what is Jesus doing? That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that, what's he doing? He might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Jesus has cleaned us, and he's preparing us for glory, and he's preparing us to show and share his hope in this world. So it's not even up to you. Let Jesus prepare your heart for the mission this week, even as we pass the bread and the cup. Ask him to sanctify you, to cleanse you, to wash you, and to prepare you. Well, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he passed it to his disciples. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus gave his body and his blood to make us his family, to bring us to God.
So let me pray for these and then we'll pass them out. Heavenly Father, thank you for the sacrifice of your son Jesus and the power of your Holy Spirit in us, those who have called on his name. Help us as we eat the bread and drink the cup, remember the great sacrifice that even though we will suffer for knowing Jesus in this world, he suffered in our place to pay the penalty for our sins and he died and rose again to give us victory over sin, Satan, and even death. What great hope he has purchased for us. In his name, we ask that you would help us eat and drink. We pray, amen.
meals for a family, the family of God, purchased by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. As you eat the bread in a moment and drink the cup in a moment, remember that Jesus was comfortable in perfect loving harmony with the Father and the Spirit forever, eternity past. And he left that comfortable place and took on human flesh and died and shed his blood so we could be forgiven of our sins and brought back to God. He left his comfort zone and suffered for you. And he sends us out into this world to show and share the hope of Jesus. And we've got to remember that he is the one who does it. We can't change hearts and lives, but he did this sacrifice for us to change our hearts and lives, to bring us to God. So when Jesus gave the disciples the bread, he said, take it. This is my body. Join me in eating the bread. And then he said to me about the drink, do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. So as you're drinking this, remember the good news of Jesus and how hopeful you are. Join me in drinking this hopeful drink. If you're able, please stand and sing with us.
I'm not going to end with a benediction. I'm going to end with a question. I hope you know what I'm going to ask. If you need hope, you don't have it, stay and talk to us. Let us love you in Jesus' name. If you're a guest or a visitor or you, just, you know you're not a Christian, let us talk to you and love you and show you the love of Christ. And let us talk to you about the hope that we have, the hope that gives us victory over sin, Satan, and death. In Scripture, we're reminded that the God of hope fills us with all joy and peace as we trust in Him, that we might overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So brothers and sisters in Christ, I'll end with a question. How are you doing? Hopeful. Go hopeful in Jesus' name. God bless you.